Good morning, everyone. It's about time to begin our uh, Bible class. Um, normally, in our Bible class, we are, are studying the book of Jeremiah. Uh, but this weekend, Jeff Smeltzer is with us uh, doing a series on the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be speaking to us this morning during our Bible class uh, session. And then also during our worship time, he'll be speaking with us as well. And then tonight, uh, during our, Bible, our worship service tonight, Jeff Smeltzer will be speaking with us. I'll give a more formal introduction to Jeff during our worship hour. But for now, I want to turn it over to Jeff for our Bible class uh, hour and give him the time to, uh, to talk more about the Holy Spirit. Good morning. So I've been doing a lot of the talking, almost all of the talking. This morning, I'm going to get you to help me out just a little bit. So speak up. I try not to bite off anybody's head or anything. And, um, but let's begin with prayer. Our gracious God, we come before you with thanksgiving for your rule over all the universe. We live in a world where we see the consequences of man's disobedience, the consequences of sin. We are thankful to you that you have shown us a better way. You have shown us your way. We are especially thankful to you that you have provided a means for forgiving us in the sacrifice of Jesus. We are thankful for the opportunity to work together as your children to be useful servants in your kingdom. We pray that you will bless us as we endeavor to be lights in this world around us and help other, others to see your way in the salvation that is in Jesus. We, we pray that as we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, that we will learn things that we need to understand and that we'll be motivated to walk in your statutes, which was your intention in sending the Spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray your blessing upon our work this morning and our worship to you. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to talk about um, the fact that there would come a time when the... Uh, direct revelation from the Spirit would come to an end and that the signs that people would do to confirm that revelation would come to an end. That's the general idea this morning. And I think I want to start with a passage in Hebrews, the first, Hebrews, the first chapter with you. <clears throat> and if I'm not careful, I've got a few remarks I want to say Make and, and if I'm not careful, I'll get in the habit of talking and I'll forget to bring you into this. And I do want to bring you into this this morning. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, having of old time spoken unto the fathers in the prophets. This is an older translation. It says, by diverse portions and in diverse manners. That sounds a little odd. Who's got either an English standard version or a legacy standard Bible or maybe even an NIV? Who's got something like that? Would you read the NIV, the first verse there? In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times in various ways. In many times in various ways. Thank you, Chad. Now, that's how God had been speaking, the lots of different ways to lots of different people over the years. But the next verse. In the last days, he's spoken to us in his son. Doesn't that kind of sound like a progression of revelation, of communication from God to man over the aeons, over the centuries, that culminated in his communication in Jesus? Doesn't that sound like that? When you read that verse, you come away with this idea that God has been working at communicating his will to man, building, building, building. We're going to talk more about that in the next hour. Building, 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 until it all comes to a culmination in Jesus. And if we have that understanding, we shouldn't be surprised at the idea that in Jesus and in the times of Jesus, you get the full revelation of God and there doesn't need to be future revelation. So I want to start with that idea. All right, it's going to be in 1 Corinthians 13, which is, uh, that's the passage where Paul is going to talk about when this would come to a conclusion. And I guess I need to turn this thing on. That would help. So far, oh, let's do this. Somebody tell me, don't look, somebody tell me the three C's that we've been talking about. The work of the Spirit doesn't mean this is everything the Spirit's 
does, but what are the three C's we've talked about? Good. And which one of those is our response to the work of the Spirit? Confirmation. All right. Anybody remember the passage of Scripture where I took that word confirmation from? Romans 8, verse 28. Uh, Whom he foreknew, he foreordained to be conformed to the image of his Son. Well, how do we get conformed to the image of his Son? Well, by walking in God's statutes. What was the passage in the Old Testament where God said, I'm going to put my spirit within them and cause them to walk in my statutes? What was So Jeremiah 31, 31 and following talks about a similar idea, uses the language of I will put my law within them and on their hearts I will write it. What's the passage that talks about I will put my spirit within them? Same concept, but I'll put my spirit within them and cause them to walk in my statutes. Ezekiel 36. What verse? Good, because I couldn't remember for sure, and I was hoping you'd know. So. Well, let's just assume we're right. So we're close. All right, so those are the concepts we've been working on. So, so... We've, I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going to come back to this slide. I'm going to skip this slide for now. Oh, this, is, this is kind of the summation of what we're going to do this morning. That what we've seen is um, that when we get to Acts chapter 8 and going forward, the means whereby the Spirit comes upon people so that they can do signs and that they can get direct revelation is through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Name three passages. You, name one passage. You can start with Acts 8. If you want the gimme, you can say Acts 8. And it, so name one of three passages where we see apostles laying hands on people, and as a result, they speak in tongues, they prophesy, they have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Name one. Acts 19, first several verses. That's one of them. Name another one. 2 Timothy 1, excellent. And then the gimme. That, that's X8. Say, say X8. X8, that's right. You got them. You got all three of them. Okay. All right. Well, the point we're going to make is, you know, somebody says, well, you know what? God doesn't have to do it that way. He could give the Spirit to people without laying on, uh, the hand, laying on of apostles' hands. Is that true? Sure he could. But, but the point is, we get to X8, and he didn't. He chose to do it through the laying on of the apostles' hands. We say, well, it could be through the laying on of anybody's hands. Is, is that true? It could be if God wanted to do it that way. But he didn't. There was Philip. He had the Holy Spirit. He did miracles. But he could not impart that ability to the people he was baptizing. There had to be apostles come all the way from where? And we, we talked about how far that was away. How far was it? Anybody remember? Yeah, this far. <laughs> 30, 35 miles, about, roughly. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. So, um, and that's assuming we're going to the, to the city of Samaria, but that, that area. Okay. So, what that suggests then is, when we get to the time that the apostles have all died, then unless God says, well, I'm going to do this another way, th there's no more imparting of the Holy Spirit, not through laying all the apostles' hands, and, and we're not going to see another thing happening after that. The second point is that the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit will have been fulfilled. <clears throat> so the purpose is those first two things, Communication and confirmation. The purpose was to communicate God's will to man and then to do a sign to confirm. This is a message from God. You know, Mason didn't just make it up. You know, God talked to him and, and he did a sign to show that. So they needed that because they did not have what? They did not have this. Now we've got this. So if I go to Samaria and I'm preaching the gospel like Philip did, I don't need to get a direct revelation to know what to preach them. 
I've got it right here. And when I preach to them and I say, Jesus was raised from the dead, it says so. Well, I, uh, I say, Jesus was raised from the dead. And they say, well, why should we believe you? I can say, well, it says so right here. Philip didn't have this. Now, in the next hour, what we're going to talk about is, yeah, but how can I believe this? And we'll talk about God's self-confirming word. But we'll do that in the next hour. All right, so our, our task this morning, then, is to see that uh, we've got the means coming to an end, the purpose being fulfilled, and, and it was all needed at that time because there were no scriptures, the, the totality of the scriptures had not been put into writing. And so going forward from that time, if I need confirmation, well, these signs are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God. We'll come back to that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. So in 1 Corinthians 13, this is the chapter that talks about love. Where do we usually hear uh, somebody talk about 1 Corinthians 13. What, a bit, what event? What occasion? Marriages. Marriages. That's fine. How many of you in your wedding, somebody read from 1 Corinthians 13? Anybody? Okay, that's fine. It's, it's, it's a, love is important in a marriage, kind of, right? Yeah. But the passage here is talking about love, not just specifically with regard to marriage. It's in a context. The whole context of 1 Corinthians 13, 12, 13, and 14 is about what? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Kind of what we're talking about, the work of the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 12, Paul argues that each gift is important. So let's look at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for just a moment. <clears throat> we need to, I need to pick up the pace a little bit. I think we'll do all right. So at the beginning of chapter 12 in verse 1, I, my Bible says, now concerning spiritual gifts. What does the NIV say, Chad? 12. Chapter 12, verse 1. I'm, get, get to chapter 12, verse 1, because I'm going to come to some of you other folks here in just a second. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. Now about the gifts of the Spirit? Now about the gifts of the Spirit. Now about. Mine says now concerning spiritual gifts. His says now about the gifts of the Spirit. Calvin, Valentine, what does yours say? It's very similar to what I've got, yeah. Um, if you look back, look at the beginning of chapter 8 and verse 1. And so Calvin, yours probably says, now concerning things sacrificed to idols in chapter 8 and verse 1 maybe. And I'm guessing yours is going to say, now about things sacrificed to idols in chapter 8. Yeah. So if you go through 1 Corinthians, you'll notice that there are sections where Paul talks about some topic, and he'll introduce the topic now about or now concerning, and then he'll talk about that for at least a chapter or maybe several chapters. So we get to chapter 12, and he's going to talk about or concerning spiritual gifts. And we come down to chapter 12 and verse 4, and he says there's diversities of gifts. There's a lot of different gifts, but the same spirit. This is kind of a theme. In how many, this is, this is true, false. The church at Corinth was characterized by great unity. False, false. All right, here's another one, true, false. The church at Corinth had a lot of problems with division. The true, okay. Well, when we get spiritual gifts, we see evidence of their divisive spirit, their divisive attitude. And so what Paul says is, look, there's a lot of gifts, but there's only one spirit, and all these gifts are from the same spirit, and they're all working to the same end. And so he's trying to put things in perspective, and he names a lot of gifts. I don't believe that we necessarily have an exhaustive list of all the gifts of the spirit in verses 8 through 11. What do you think about that? Do you think that's an exhaustive list, or you just think he... This, do we know? Well, yeah, that's a good answer. Um, verse, but, but I want you to notice in verses 8 through 10, to one, to one person is given through the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. So this is a spiritual gift, a word of knowledge, and it's given through the Spirit, a word of knowledge. So this knowledge, is this knowledge you get from reading Wikipedia? No. It, where, where do you get it from? You get it from the, the Spirit. Is this knowledge that you get from living on this earth 70 years and just having lots of experience? 
This is knowledge from the Spirit. Spirit revealed knowledge. And, and you need to remember that because we're going to see that again in chapter 13. In verse uh, 9, he says, to another faith in the same Spirit. It's kind of interesting to think about faith as a direct operation of the Spirit. Faith being given to somebody. We, we think of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? But we also know that when the apostles didn't have enough faith, they couldn't cast the demon out of a man, for example. And when they healed a lame man in Acts 3, it was by faith, by faith in Jesus' name. And Jesus talks about if you have enough faith, you can move mountains. Apparently, and I really don't understand this, but apparently there was some gift of faith from the Holy Spirit that helped equip these people that had these... Don't ask me to explain it beyond that. I really don't understand. But then it goes on and it says, uh, verse 9, to another gifts of healings in the one spirit, to another workings of miracles. And then it says, to another prophecy, prophecy. So we talked about the fact that in the Bible, a prophet is somebody who's a mouth for God. He speaks what God gives him to speak and he repeats it to others. We also talked about the fact that in the New Testament, it seems like sometimes the word prophecy is used in a more narrow sense, a subcategory of that. But here we have prophecy mentioned, and then we have discerning of spirits. I'd love to talk with you about that, but we're just not going to have time. And to another, different kinds of tongues. Chad, does your Bible say in verse... Um, verse 10, at the uh, last half of verse 10, where mine says different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Does yours say tongues or languages? Uh, different kinds of tongues. Different kinds of tongues. Uh, what is your, let's see. Um, let's see. We have a fellow from India here this morning, right there. And I, this is risky because your mother tongue is probably English. But what is your mother tongue? Telugu. Telugu or Telugu? I forget. We Telugu, right? Telugu. All right. Telugu is his mother tongue. What did I ask him when I said, what's your mother tongue? I'm asking him, what's your, what language were you born in? What language did you start speaking? That's what tongues is talking about in this passage. It's, talking, it's not talking about something that's non-language. It's talking about language. We've looked at a passage a good bit the last two nights or last two days where we saw people speaking in tongues, and they were speaking in all different languages. What, what passage was that? Acts 2. Everybody say, Acts 2. Boy, I sure thought there were a lot of people in here this morning. <laughs> Acts 2. Okay. All right. Then we come to verse 10, and after mentioning different kinds of tongues, it mentions the interpretation of tongues. Now, I do need to move along. I've got to pick up the pace here. Uh, he goes on in the rest of chapter 12 to say the, the body, our physical body, is one body, but we have different parts of the body that do different things. My finger does certain things. My hand, my eye does other things. My ears do other things. They all have different jobs, but the body is one. And he says the body of Christ is like that. We, we have different roles in the body of Christ, but all are important. And he applies that to spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are like that. It's kind of funny reading this section in verse 17 and following, or verse 16 and following. He says, if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it not therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And just imagine, Mason. If the whole, can you picture a, per, a body, a, a whole body that, Olivia here, pretend Olivia, she's just an eyeball. That's all she, all she is. That's just an eyeball. And she's got to get from here to that door. She's, I guess she's going to roll. <laughs> and, and wouldn't that be painful when you, oh, especially if there were anything on the carpet and you rolled onto, uh, it just stick you in the eye. You need other parts of the body, don't you? Okay? All right. So that's his point. And then he talks about how this, the body of Christ is like that. And, and as you read down, you get the impression the Corinthians didn't get that. They were clamoring for one of the gifts. It's like, of all the gifts, there was one that they seemed to want, and it seems to be tongues. 
as you go through this. Why they wanted speaking in tongues more than anything else, that's interesting, but that's what it seems to be. So you get to the end of chapter 12, and Paul says there's something more important than any of these gifts. And he's going to talk about that in chapter 13. What is it he says is more, whoop, the, what is it he says is more important than any of the gifts? Love. Good. And, and he says uh, in, in verse, um, well, let's start in verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become sounding brass. I'm just something making a noisy sound, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, he's speaking in hyperbole here. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. And, and he goes on in this fashion, talking about what love is. Verse 4, love suffers long, is kind, envies not. So he's talking about why love is so important. And then we get to verse 8, and he's going to give us one more reason why love is so important. It's even more important than the spiritual gifts. Look at verse 8, and somebody summarize for me why love, according to verse 8, is more important than the spiritual gifts. Hmm? It never ends. As opposed to what? He mentions three things, and they are prophecy, tongues, knowledge. Remember we saw knowledge was one of the gifts of the Spirit. Those things, he says, are going to come to an end. And love is not, which means love is more important than any of them. And the next thing he does is he tells us when. He tells us when those things are going to come to an end. Verse 9. Oh, we've got to talk about verse 9 before we see the when. We'll get to the when. Verse 9. We know in part and we prophesy in part. When he says we know in part, he's just mentioned the gift of knowledge, right? Hasn't he? He says we know in part. He's not saying we only kind of, you know, know some things. He's talking about this gift of knowledge is in part. And I want you to see what that means. So what happens is in chapter 14, he's going to talk about how you use these gifts when you come together in the assembly. And one of the things you'll get out of this discussion is the Christians' assemblies were not to be faith healing services. They were not to be just miracle shows. They were to come together to build one another up. And if they use these spiritual gifts, they need to use them in a way that builds people up by teaching them, not just putting on a show. And so as he explains that in chapter 14, he says this in verse 26. What is it then, brethren, when you come together? Notice he's talking about when you come together in the assembly. Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue. Let it be by two, or at the most, three. And that in turn, and let somebody interpret. You're going to use tongues in your assembly? Well, he's already told them earlier, prophecy is better because people understand. If you're going to speak in tongues, only two or three people, and those two or three people need to take turns. Why? Because this is not just an emotional kind of outburst thing where everybody gets excited. Blah, blah. This is a kind of thing where there is to be the last part of verse um, um, 26. Edifying. Let all things be done unto edifying. Building up. And you're going to build up. He's already explained uh, back in uh, verse 6 by revelation or knowledge or prophesying or teaching. That's how you're going to build up. So if you're going to speak in tongues, take turns, and don't even do it at all unless there is an interpreter present. Because the point is to communicate, to instruct, to give revelation so that people can be built up spiritually. And then he says in verse, 20, uh, verse 29, let the prophets speak by two or three and let the others discern. But if a revelation be made to another sitting by, let the first keep silence. So we'll, let, we'll say in this congregation, we'll say this is the church in Corinth in the first century, and Jay's a prophet. And we'll say Kevin's a prophet. And we'll say Mark's a prophet. And uh, Mark's got a revelation, 
And he tells us, you know, the Spirit said to me last uh, Wednesday that I need to tell you all such and such. Okay. Well, we know he's a prophet, and so we, we listen to that. And then Jay says, well, I've got a revelation too. Uh, on Friday, the Spirit said to me, and I want to tell you what he says, and he starts talking, and right at that moment, Kevin gets a revelation from the Spirit. I don't know how we know that, but Kevin gets a revelation right at that moment from the Spirit. Mark is going into, uh, I mean, Jay, is going into some long-winded explanation of what the Spirit said, kind of like I do. And, uh, and, and Kevin says, excuse me, <laughs> the Spirit has just now given me a revelation. What's Jay supposed to do? Somebody read for me verse 20, verse 30. Uh, let's pick on somebody. Let's pick on, let's see here, uh, Jake. Mm -hmm. So what's Jay supposed to do? Shut up. <laughs> they might have been a little more polite about it. but And so Kevin now is going to speak. What do you notice that implies? Did Jay have all of God's will? Had he, did he have everything that would be? No, he didn't. If he did, he could have just said it, but he didn't. Now, I don't know why, you know, maybe the idea here is that if Kevin gets a revelation right now in the middle of the assembly, maybe the idea is the Spirit says this is something needs to be said right now. And so that's, the, that's why the priority. But the point I want you to see is Jay doesn't have it all. As a matter of fact, Mark didn't have it all because Mark had one thing and, and Jay had another and Kevin's got another piece. No one of them had the whole revelation of God's will. As a matter of fact, they're only supposed to speak, have two or three speak in one of their assemblies. Did you notice that? So we've been here since Friday night. We've been here Friday night and yesterday and now today do you all expect me to say everything there is about God's will in this weekend? Do you even want me to keep you here long enough today to say everything that there is? Do I even know everything? But do I have everything? There may be some things I've yet to study, I need to study, but I've got it all. So at any point when a question arises or something, I may have to work a little bit, but I've got it all. I don't have to wait for the Spirit to say something he hasn't already said. So what I'm telling you is in their assemblies, by the gift of prophecy or tongues or knowledge, they got partial revelations. Jay got a piece. Kevin got a piece. Mark got a piece. And the next week, they might get other pieces. But they were getting the revelation of God in bits and pieces. Is that ideal? Is that God's ultimate plan? God's ultimate plan is this. The whole revelation of God put here in a package where you can consult it, study it, you've got it. So we go back to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and it says in verse 9, for we know in part, Chad, I'm curious, do you have 1 Corinthians 13, 9 in the NIV? What does it say? Verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Same thing. Part, partial. All right, what is the opposite of partial? Somebody tell me what you think the opposite of partial, just a word. Opposite of partial, what? Whole, whole, that's, that's right. There's another word that would be a synonym for whole. What is it? Complete. What word does Paul use in our English translations in verse 10? Perfect. Now this confuses people. Because people read this and they fail to understand that perfect is the opposite of partial. And the reason we do that is because the English word perfect has kind of evolved in its meaning. I looked it up this morning online. I said, Google, perfect, definition. And it said something like, as good as it can be. <laughs> I've got a big dictionary. It's about this big. Okay, okay. <laughs> But anyway, it's a big dictionary in my office that I never, ever consult because I just Google it. But I did a few weeks ago. I opened it up, published in 1946. Here's what it says. 
perfect in the upper hand, upper left hand. And notice that the number one definition is complete in all respects. And then uh, you come down to perfect, which would be the verb, and the number one definition is to finish or complete. That's the meaning of the word perfect that the translators had in mind when they started using perfect in our English Bibles. It's the meaning of the word that's translated perfect. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, you know where, we could give a lot of examples, I'm just going to give one for sake of time. You remember in Matthew chapter 5 where he's talking about love, love, you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but Jesus says, no, if you're going to be sons of God, you need to love everybody, love your enemy, and he, and he he makes the point because God sends his sunshine on the evil and the good and his rain on the just and the unjust. That's illustrating the fact that God loves everybody. And so he says, if you're going to be sons of God, you've got to love like God loves. And then at the end of that paragraph, he says, and, well, I'm going to have to read it because I can't quite quote it. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, the end of that paragraph, which is going to be verse 48, therefore you shall be perfect. That confuses people because we say, wait a minute, we're not perfect, right? It says, therefore you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You're going to be perfect like God is? Well, if you understand the meaning is complete, God loves completely, not just partially, not just those who, who love him. God loves completely. Well, our love is to be complete, is to be for these and for these and for these. Our love is to be complete. That illustrates the meaning of the word com perfect, is complete. All right, back to our context, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says that uh, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, another way to say that is when that which is complete is come, then the what? The partial will be done away. What's the partial? Well, speaking in tongues, prophesying, the knowledge, those communications from the Holy Spirit directly by means of these gifts, those things would come to an end. Why would they come to an end? Because you've got the whole, what, who said whole? Kyle, was it you? That, no, it was Dave that said, you've got the whole thing now. That's his point in 1 Corinthians 13. All right, let's see if we need another slide here. The gifts will cease, love will endure, and um, so he now draws a contrast. Oh, let's see, are we ready for that? Yeah. All right, so here's what we've got. He mentions prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, and these are all mentioned back in chapter 12 when he lists a bunch of the gifts of the Spirit. I believe they are representative. They are uh, examples of the gifts. And he says whenever the complete comes, whenever, whenever that is, then those things are going to cease. And then he goes on, and he says, what do we have next? Yeah, he's going to say faith, hope, and love are going to keep going. All right, so if you'll look down to verse 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. So his point over all in chapter 13 is to say love is, what's his overall point in chapter 13? Love is greater. And he's given lots of reasons why love is greater, but the reason he's working on right here is love is greater because it's going to outlast. These gifts are going to come to an end, but love is going to keep going. And, and, and by the way, that's one of the reasons why we, we can rightly conclude when he says prophets, tongues, and knowledge, that's representative of all the gifts because his point in this context is to compare love with all of the spiritual gifts. Love is greater than all the gifts. Because love is going to outlast them. And so then, uh, let's see, where are we? Oh, yeah. So here's what people think, though. They think, wait a minute. Jesus is perfect. Would anybody deny that? Anybody here want to stand up and say, I don't think that's right? Jesus is perfect. So people think, well, Jesus is perfect. So maybe this complete, when that comes, and the prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are going to cease, that's maybe when Jesus is going to come back. How many of you have heard somebody take that understanding of this passage? How many of us have kind of wondered ourselves if maybe that's what it's talking about? No? Yeah? No? <laughs> we can look at the context, see that's not what it is. So somebody says, well, what if really the complete 
is when Jesus comes at the last day. Well, then the conclusion would be prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are going to go all the way down to here. And then faith, hope, and love will continue. You see what they're thinking? You see how they're reasoning? And so they come to the conclusion. What, what conclusion do they come to about speaking in tongues today? It's still present because we're going to have them until the perfect comes. And they're thinking the perfect is, is the last day when, we, when Jesus comes. All right, what about that? Well, if you look at verse uh, 13, he says, But now abide faith, hope, love, these three. So there's a contrast between verse 8 and verse 3. Verse 8 is, love never fails, but where there be prophecies, they'll be done away. Tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge, it'll be done away. Verse 13, but now abide, not done away. Abide, continue, remain. I'm curious, Chad, NIV for verse 13. And now these three remain. Remain, remain. Mine says abide. Who has the English Standard Version? Abide. Anybody have the Legacy Standard Bible? For what it's worth, I've not done a, a thorough study of the Legacy Standard Bible. I've been using it for the last few months for my slides a lot, and I like it a lot. But anyway, there's a contrast here between things that are going to cease and things that are going to remain. And so he says, faith, hope, and love are going to, but it says now. It says now, but now abide. But that now is used in the same sense as down in chapter 14, verse 5. Now, I would have you all speak with tongues, but rather that you should prophesy. Does he mean right now, like right now, or does he just mean, now, you know, husbands, does your wife ever say, now, when you come home from work tonight, please remember to pick up a gallon of milk. Do your, your wives ever say anything like that to you? Now, when you come home from work tonight, does she mean right now? What's the purpose of the now in that sentence? It's kind of like now, now I'm telling you, I'm, I'm getting your attention now like that. And that's the way the Greeks often use this word. It's actually a shortened form of the word in verse 13 compared to the word in verse 5. But you'll see passages in the New Testament where it's used just like that. And that's the way it's being used in verse 13. But now abideth, faith, hope, or now remain, in contrast to the things that are going to cease, there are going to be some things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Now here's a question for you. If indeed the complete is Jesus when he comes at the last day, that would mean that the spiritual gifts, the prophecies, tongues, and knowledge would cease at that time, and what would hope do? Hope would remain, wouldn't it? Do you, see, do you all see that? Raise your hand if you see that. Just so I... Well, I was hoping for a few more hands. <laughs> will, will hope remain? Turn over to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 24 through 25. <clears throat> for in hope were we saved... But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? I met you this morning coming in. I don't remember the name. Josh. Josh, do you hope you have a good lunch today? You do? Okay. So suppose you're sitting down at lunch today and you're enjoying it. Are you going to sit there and say to your wife, boy, I hope I have a good lunch today? You're already, you already have it. We're not going to be sitting hoping for our salvation down here. That's, that can't be what it's talking about in this context. Paul illustrates his point. Let's start in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Probably need to stop at a quarter till. Is that about right? Quarter till, ten till? You say two minutes till? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says in verse 11, When I was a child, I spoke as a child, 
I felt as a child, I thought as a child, now that I've become a man, I put away childish things. We grow up, we mature, we become perfected, and we put away some of the things we did as children. Well, the church is like that. There were things that it needed in its development stage. Until all of the revelation of God's will got put into writing, there was a need for some things that would not be needed later on, and that would be the direct revelation and the confirmation by signs that what somebody claimed they got from the Spirit, they really did get from the Spirit. Um, Ed, did you get up this morning before you decided to come and be here with us today? Did you get out the grandkids' Legos and play with Legos this morning? No, not really, but you're a builder. You do build things, right? But not the childish things, right? You've kind of grown up. All right, I, I do have to tell you, though, when one of my daughters... We, her gift one year was a set of Lego, and and the night before I spent I stayed up nearly all night building a big semi tractor trailer truck with the Lego set. But but you get the idea that Paul is saying there's certain things you need at a certain stage of development. You get to maturity and you don't need it anymore. Spiritual gifts, the direct revelation and the confirmation. And uh, I do need to hustle up because your classes, your younger classes are getting out. Okay, so th that's an illustration. He's not saying that if you're a child, you'll speak in tongues, and when you become a man, you don't need to speak in tongues. It's an illustration of the church. And the next part is also an illustration, and people forget that. They get to verse 12, and all of a sudden, they think we're talking literally instead of an illustration. And they read verse 12, for now we see in a mirror darkly or obscurely, but then face to face. And we have a lot of songs that misinterpret this, and they take this as being about seeing Jesus face to face, because they've already got it in their heads that Jesus is the perfect thing. And so they think right here, Paul is saying, see, when the perfect comes, we will see Jesus face to face, and that makes them think that it's talking about this but it's an illustration just like the part about being a child was an illustration and his illustration is if I'm looking in a mirror and think of it not as a really crisp glass mirror as we have but maybe like a bronze mirror or something and I look at it and it's kind of obscure what I'm seeing there but if I see face to face that's a lot more clear that's the and that's what he's his, is to illustrate the point that when we've only got partial revelation we we really don't have the complete understanding like we will when we have the whole revelation how many of you have realized when you see the big picture of the Bible and we're going to talk about this in the next hour when you can see the big picture of the Bible all the little parts become clearer you can have you realized that that's what we have in the scripture. All right, so uh, we've done that. We've said, nope, hope won't endure past the time the perfect comes. So this is what we're talking about. The purposes of the gifts were to reveal and confirm, and the distribution was by the apostles. Well, the purposes, revealing and confirming, are now accomplished by this, and the means of distribution, the apostles are no longer around. So... He illustrates it. When I was a child, I needed prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. When I become a man, put away childish things, talking about the church. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, it's an illustration. With the gifts, you're just getting bits and pieces of revelation, but you're going to get the whole thing and you'll see more clearly. So partial revelation would come to an end when the complete has come, and once you have the complete revelation, the opposite of partial revelation, then faith, hope, and love remain. But the spiritual gifts have come to an end. I think that's everything we need to do. Yeah, so the means was by the apostles' hands, no more apostles. The purpose was to reveal and confirm. It's been revealed, been confirmed. They didn't have the scriptures. We do. John 20, the written account of the signs is sufficient for us. We'll talk more about that in the next hour, that we may believe we've got all of the revelation, we've got all of the confirmation. So these two facts point to why the gifts would come to an end, because they were needed during that period of time. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. We'll leave it there. We'll take a break, and in the next hour, we're going to talk about God's self-confirming word.